Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday Morning Breakfast Bible Study with Pastor Lydia Evelyn Spragan, the pastor of the New Destiny Christian Methodist Episcopal Church located at 825 Lorenz Avenue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15520. That's not right. 15220. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come with bowed heads and open hearts. Teach us, Father God, today what you would have us to know. Send your Holy Spirit to enlighten us. We thank you, Father God, for this study. We thank you, Father God, for your teaching. And most of all, Father God, we thank you for your love, for your son, Jesus the Christ, who came, lived among us, and died in order that we might have life, abundant life, and life eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are. We are in the book of Ruth, and we are studying, we are studying um, the passage found in the first chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. Now, today, I have my colored pencils because I want us to highlight a couple of phrases in the passage that we're going to look at today. Let's start at the 15th chapter. And again, I'm using the NIV Cultural Backgrounds Study Bible, large print, bringing to life the ancient world of scripture by Zondervan. Verse 15, look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her God. Go back with her. Okay, going back. Let us underline her people and her God. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. In the 16th verse, let us underline, your people will be my people, and your God, my God. And then in the 17th verse, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Now, uh, grammatically, the first thing that we want to note is that the term God in verse 15 is a little g, a little g. So we immediately note that we are not talking about Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. We are talking about a lesser, inferior God than the Israelites. So Naomi a devout Israelite is urging her, her being Ruth, and uh, the other sister-in-law, Orpha, to go back to her people and her gods. And what she's saying is, you go back to your inferior gods. You go back to what it was that you were worshiping. 
And basically, she's sending them away from the true and living God, Yahweh, back to an inferior God. Okay, keep that in mind as we study today. She's sending her back not only to her people, the Moabites, but she's sending her back to her God. And note that the word God here, G-O-D, has an S on the end of it. Now, what do we know? We know on the one hand that Yahweh is a monotheistic God. That means he's one God. They worship only one God, Yahweh. She's sending her back to God. So she's asking her to leave a monotheistic theology and go back to a polytheistic or a many God theology. So we've got two immediate things that we see. A deviation from the true and living God. A deviation from monotheism to polytheism. And a urging, if you will, by someone who knows who the true and living God is, sending them back into a polytheistic society where the true and living God is not worshipped. Now, the next thing we see is she says, Ruth responds, and she says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And here she says, your people will be my people. She said, I am willing to leave my cultural background and all I know and my parents and follow you into a place that I don't know, that I don't really understand, and that the only exposure that I've ever had is through my husband and you. That's all I know. But I'm willing to leave what I do know. Now, what she knew was something about the Moabites. She was Moabitess. Now, that's going to become important to us because as we look at the cultural background of the Israelites, we need to understand what is the cultural background of the Moabites. Naomi has been living among them for at least 10 years. Okay, her husband died. Her sons have died there. And she is left there in a foreign land with foreign countries, in a place where foreign lesser gods are being worshipped. So we need to understand what is the difference, if you will, between the Israelite and the Moabite culture. And that's going to give us a deeper insight into really what the book of Ruth, the story of Naomi, is all about. Because here, Ruth is actually showing more faith in Naomi's God. Because she says, I'm going to follow you where you may go. And it's a voluntary following. It's not a calling like the Abrahamic calling or the uh in in Genesis 12 verses 1 through uh 3 or 5 it's not that kind of calling let's flip over there for a moment so we can see the difference Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 says The Lord had said to Abram, and this is before his name was changed, go from your country 
your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. God is telling him to leave his people, to leave uh, his country, to leave his household to the land that I will show you. God is in control of moving Abraham. God is not in control of Ruth. She's a Moabitess. She doesn't have a, a, a an allegiance yet to this God, but she is making an allegiance to Naomi. She's saying, where you go, I will go. You know, where where you die, I will die. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. God is calling Abraham. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and those who curse you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God makes promises to Abraham, a covenant with Abraham. But Ruth has no such promise. She has no such covenant. Naomi is trying to send her away. She's not promising her nothing. Yet Ruth is saying, promise or no. I know what I know, and I am not going to leave you. I'm going with you. And not only am I going with you, I'm willing to leave behind everything that I know and all that I love. I'm going to make the ultimate sacrifice and go with you. So then verse 4 says, in Genesis 12, so Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. They set out for the promised land. As far as Ruth knows, Naomi has left Bethlehem, the symbolic house of bread, because there's a famine. And as far as Ruth knows, that famine is still yet going on, even though they have heard otherwise. Now, I say that because you know how it is, you know. You hear a bunch of stuff, and then you find out later that what you heard wasn't true, but you relied on it. So Ruth is relying on what they have heard, that there is now food and water plenty in Bethlehem. And she's willing to leave the, the certainty of what she knows. We have food. We have water. We have had it all the while they were in the famine. And I am willing to leave what I know and go to what I don't know. That's what you call walking by faith. Leaving what you know to go to what you don't know. You have confidence in it. You're trusting. And you're relying on the unknown to be better than that which you know. That's faith. So we go back over here. And she says, your people will be my people and your God, my God. And here we see the the use of the capital G, recognizing God, God, the the sovereign being, God, the only God, the God, God, my your God, my God, 
And then the next thing she says is, where you die, I will die. Now, we're going to look at this a little later, but we know that in the that particular culture, dying was a big deal. And where you were buried was a big deal. And yet she says, I don't have to be buried with my folk. You don't have to worry about bringing my bones back for my family to see. You bury me where I am, which will be with you. So in life and death, Ruth is basically saying, I am giving up everything to follow you. Now, how important is that? What is it that she's actually giving up? And in that sense of the word, we want to be able to compare Israel and Moab. We have to in order to get a big understanding because it seems to the naked eye that Ruth is foolish. She's got the opportunity to go back to her parents, to go back to what she knows, to go back to her God, to go back to her way of life. And this just be a little blip in her life. But she chooses to take this quote, unquote, little blip and turn it into her lifetime. So we need to understand the culture here. So let us look for a moment. And I know we have the the cultural study Bible here, and they do a really good job on verses 15, her people and her gods, and verse 16, your God, my God. But it went a little bit right over my head. As y'all know, I'm not a a quote-unquote Bible scholar. So sometimes I got to go steal a little bit out on my own and see what I can find that I can understand and relate to. So the first question that came to my mind was, who indeed are the Moabites? And what does their God actually look like and where did they come from because if you remember when we studied the book of Genesis and we looked at the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 they was all related to each other even though they were tribes and nations and nations coming out of nations they were all related so how are the Moabites related to God's chosen people Okay, so I I did a little research on the internet, and basically I typed in Moabite gods, and I ended up with the phrase Moabite gods and goddesses, and I took a little excerpt from here and there, but there's a lot of information on the web, much more than I have the time to go through now, and so I just want to kind of give you um, a gist, if you will. When we talk about ancient civilizations in the Middle East, we cannot ignore the Moabites. The Moabites were a group of people who lived in the land of Canaan, which is modern-day Jordan. They were a nomadic tribe who settled in the area around the Arman River and the Dead Sea. The Moabites played a significant role in the history of the Middle East. The Moabites were neighbors to many other ancient civilizations, including the Edomites, the Amorites, and the Ammonites. Edomites, E-D-O-M-I-T-E-S. Amorites, A-M-O-R-I-T-E-S. And Ammonites, A-M-M-O-N-I-T-E-S. Now, 
if we don't remember anything else about the Edomites, the Amorites, and the Ammonites, what we do know about them is they were at times at war with the Israelites. The Moabite culture was thought to be very similar to that of the Israelites. Evidence shows that they may have shared a common origin. The Moabites were known to be skilled agriculturists, and they worshipped many gods and goddesses. They had their own distinct religious practices with the god Chemosh, C-H-E-M-O-S-H, being their primary deity. So now we see that the primary deity of the Moabites is Chemosh, and we know that the primary deity, the only deity of the Israelites was Yahweh. Okay? Their practices included, when I say there now, I'm referring back to the Moabites. Their practices included animal sacrifice, wine offering, and other ritualistic practices. The Moabites believed that these deities controlled the forces of nature and the fate of their people. They would offer sacrifices and make offerings to these gods in exchange for their favor. Some historical context is necessary to understand the Moabites. They were the descendants of Lot. Oops. Did we just say Lot? Abraham's nephew? The Israelites were descendants of Abraham or children of Abraham. Came down the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose later his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, and therefore you get the 12 tribes of Israel and the Moabites descended from Lot. So there we have it. We have some connection, some relation between the Moabites and the Israelites. Lot, the nephew of Abraham, and his eldest daughter. They were descendants of Lot, the nephew of Abraham, and his eldest daughter. During the time of King David, the Moabites lived on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. They were often in conflict with their neighbors, including the Israelites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites. The Moabite religion seems to have shared several features with that of other Iron Age kingdoms in the region, such as Israel, Edom, and Ammon, and all of them probably inherited much from their Bronze Age Canaanite predecessors. However, while it used to be commonplace to claim that all four kingdoms had their own national god, Kamash, and, and it's also spelled K-E-M-O-S-H, so you can see it's spelled K-E and C-H-E-M-O-S-H, and they're talking about the same god with the little g of the Moabites. So there were four kingdoms that basically we had. Moab, Israel, Edom, and Ammon. And each of them had what they call a national god. For the Moabites, it was Kamash. For the Israelites, it was Yahweh. For the Edomite, it was Quas, K-A-W-S. And for Ammonites, it was Milcom. M-I-L-K-O-M. Now, that's a generalization. So we, we want to be careful about generalizations, but for our purposes today, we're going to say that the, the God that the Moabites believed in the most was Kamish, Kamash. And the God that the Israelites believed in the most was Yahweh. Now, not only it was Yahweh the most that they believed in. He was the only that they believed in. Okay? He was he was their God. And they were his people. So that prompted me 
that prompted me to want to take a look at the God of Israel, Yahweh, and the Moabite God, Chemosh. And they have distinct characteristics and roles in their respective cultures and religions. So if you want, what I want you to do now is take a sheet of paper and divide it in half. Okay? On one side, I want you to put Yahweh, God of Israel. And on the other side, I want you to put Chemosh, God of the Moabites. Now, there are five characteristics that we're going to place on each side so that we have a, an understanding of where Ruth was leaving and coming to and what Naomi was going to in her favor, but where she was trying to push Ruth away from. So let's start with the side that deals with Kamash. Number one, Kimash, God of the Moabites. Number one, polytheism, P-O-L-Y-T-H-E-I-S-M, polytheism. Kamash was one of several gods worshipped by the Moabites who practiced polytheism. Number two, war and sacrifice. Number two, war and sacrifice. Kimash was often associated with war and demanded human sacrifices, particularly in times of crisis, to gain favor or victory in battle. Number three, national deity. Kimash was considered the national god of Moab, playing a central role in their identity and culture. Number four, limited ethical focus. Limited ethical focus. Unlike Yahweh, Kimash's worship did not emphasize a comprehensive moral or ethical code for daily life. Do what you want. Do what you want to do. It's all right with me. Is basically the Kamash attitude. And God says, no, no, no. You cannot have it your way. This is not Burger King. This is God as king. I'm sovereign. So there was a limited ethical fo focus if you were in the Moab tradition. And lastly, territorial deity. Territorial. T-E-R-R-I-T-O-R-I-A-L. Territorial deity. Kimash's influence was believed to be limited to the land of Moab unlike Yahweh, who was seen as sovereign over all creation. So now we have five areas of Kamash belief. Number one, polytheism. Number two, war and sacrifice, especially human sacrifice. Number three, he was a national deity. Number four, had a limited ethical focus. And number five was a territorial deity. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, let's look at Yahweh, the God of Israel. And in the context of culture and background, cultural background, let's look at Yahweh in the life of an Israelite. Number one, mono. Theism, monotheism, M-O-N-O-T-H-E-I-S-M, monotheism. Yahweh is the sole deity worshipped by the Israelites, emphasizing monotheism.
theism. Number two, a covenant relationship. Covenant, C-O-V-E-N-A-N-T, a covenant relationship. Yahweh established a covenant with the Israelites, promising them protection and blessing in return for their faithfulness and obedience. And, and we can look at the, the Mosaic and the Abrahamic covenants, which we looked at um, some time ago when we studied the covenants of the Bible. And you can look it up, just type it in, Mosaic, M-O-S-A-I-C, which deals with Moses, the covenant that God made with Moses, and Abrahamic, A-B-R-A-H-A-M-I-C, covenant, the one we just read in Genesis 12, 1 through 5. Number three, under Yahweh, there were moral and ethical standards, okay? Yahweh's laws, such as the Ten Commandments, set high moral and ethical standards for his followers. You can't do what you want to do and say that I'm under the rule of Yahweh. Yahweh is my sovereign God. Number four, providence and sovereignty. Providence, P-R-O-V-I-D-E-N-C-E, and sovereignty, S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N-T-Y. Providence and sovereignty. Yahweh is seen as the creator and sustainer of the universe involved in the lives of his people. Providence and sovereignty. And lastly, Yahweh, number five, compassion and justice. Yahweh is depicted as both compassionate and just, caring for the oppressed and demanding justice and righteousness. Now, you can see that there's a stark difference between belief in Yahweh <coughs> and belief in Kemosh. You're going from polytheism to monotheism. You're going from a God that says, do what you want to do, how you want to do it, when you want to do it, where you want to do it, however you want to do it, to a God that says, uh-uh, none of that. I'm going to lay down some rules, some laws <clears throat> called the Ten Commandments that I expect you to follow. Kamar says, I ain't got no rules. I ain't got no laws. Have it your way. God say, it's my way or the highway. <clears throat> God says, I'm going to be in covenant with you. I'm going to promise you certain things. And not only am I going to promise them, I'm going to deliver them. And I'm going to promise you protection and blessing. Kamash, on the other hand, <coughs> don't make no promises for nothing. But what he wants is human sacrifice. Human sacrifice. Now, God wants sacrifice too. But the difference is, he did not want you to sacrifice the creations that were made in his image to him. He wanted animal sacrifices. 
those creatures over whom we are supposed to have dominion. But those images, those creations that were made in his image, mm -mm. you can't sacrifice human beings to God. Kamash. Oh, man, I don't care one way or the other what you say. But if you give me human blood, I'll be satisfied. The only human blood, and it wasn't human, that God required was the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus the Christ, upon the cross at Calvary. Israel, uh, they saw Yahweh as not only their creator, but their sustainer. When Naomi said to Ruth, go back to your gods, basically she was pushing her away from looking at God as the creator and sustainer of her life. Because Naomi herself had moved from a belief of a pleasant belief in God where her name was Naomi to having a better outlook. Call me Mara, she said earlier. Call me later, she'll say, call me Mara. Bitter. Because there is no longer any trust, belief, reliance upon God as her creator and sustainer. But Ruth, on the other hand, says, I don't know this God that you're talking about, but I've heard you talk about him. And y'all told me he creator, he's the creator of everybody and everything. And he is the sustainer. So I expect that if I leave behind what I don't know, what I do know for what I don't know, that the God that you serve will sustain me, keep me, empower me, take care of me, look out for me. This God I'm leaving, he could care less. But the God that you serve cares about me. And will sustain me because he created me. I believe that. I, I I I don't I don't yet have the experience for myself. I see it through my husband and his brother and your husband and at one point in time you. That's how I've come to know what I know about your God. And based on what I've come to know, I'm going to make your God my God. Now, Yahweh is compassionate and just. Caring for the oppressed and demanding justice and righteousness. He said, come one, come all unto me. Naomi could have said, my God loves you just like he loves me. And if you come with me and follow me, my God will not only protect me, he'll protect you. He'll love you. Just as he loves me. For my God is not a respecter of persons. What he has done for me, he can do for you. And even though my plight might seem, uh, you know, bad. Even though God has made a promise to me 
and I'm going to hold on to that promise that he loves me, that he's compassionate, that he cares for me, that he's sovereign, and he has done all of this for a purpose, and whatever his purpose and plan is, and yes, I'm going beyond the scope of Ruth to, to say, as Jeremiah, the plans and purposes of God are not to do you harm. But good. She could have said all of that to Ruth and told her, come on. Come on, baby. But she did. Now, that just reminds me of sometimes how we are in the church. We know that God is good. We got a testimony. We've been through some things, and we know that God has seen us through. But rather than share what we know with somebody who doesn't yet know, we prefer to keep it to ourselves and let them struggle when they don't have to. They don't have to struggle like that. We can introduce them to God. We can introduce them to Yahweh. We can introduce them to the to the creator, to the sustainer, to the sovereign God, the one and only true God, instead of saying, go on out there, you know. Because basically that's what we're saying. If we're not telling somebody how to get to heaven, what we're really saying to them is go straight to hell, and I don't care. Your God is who your God is, drugs, alcohol. That's who you got on your throne right now. I don't care. Go back to your God. Stay out there. But see, what we're supposed to do is reach out to them. Naomi should have reached out to Ruth and said, listen, baby, I know things have been hard. And they look rough. And, and 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 I'm going back to where I come from. And I'm going to ask you by faith to come with me and check it out. And then if you don't like it, you can go back. But once you try him, you will like him. And I pray that you will come to love him. And truly make him your God as he is my God. But Naomi had lost hope. But Ruth, she had not only faith, but hope in the God that Naomi was serving. Let's move on. She says, she being Ruth now, your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Now, that's a significant phrase. And I'm going to go back to the cultural backgrounds Bible because They really do make it plain. There I will be buried. Ruth's commitment to leave her family for a land where she apparently has never been, potentially totally isolated from her own kin, commands admiration and respect. While she has probably become familiar with some Hebrew culture, customs, and beliefs, To saturate herself in the different culture has dimensions that one can only appreciate by experience. Some suggest that her loyalty surpasses that of Abraham, since he was called by divine direction. And we read that in Genesis 12, 1 through 5. And Ruth was not. To most Westerners, that's us. 
There is usually little emotional trauma in being buried away from the family plot. We don't care if we are buried with grandmama and all of them are buried or not most times. Most of us tend to, if we move away, we're buried where we are. We don't come back to where we were, where our family is to be buried in the family plot. To most Westerners, there is usually little emotional trauma in being buried away from the family plot. Such a casual approach to death was unknown to the people of ancient Canaan. Now, we back to ancient Canaan, the promised land. This is where both the Israelites and the Moabites dwelt. The Bible often refers to death as being gathered to one's people. Gathered to one's people. And then it gives us some examples. Genesis 25, 8, verse 8, and verse 17. Genesis 35, verse 29. Genesis 49, verse 33. And Numbers, chapter 20, verses 24 and 26. And Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, and the 50th verse. So all throughout the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we see death as being gathered to one's people. So let me finish reading that sentence before I, I, I go. And Jacob and Joseph gave specific instructions that their remains be conveyed to the family homeland. Genesis 49, chapter 49, verses 29 through 32, and chapter 50, verses 24 through 26. These requests are apparently not unique to the Israelites. Now, what they're saying is, don't leave me in no foreign country. Even if I'm dead, don't leave me in no foreign country. Pick my bones up and carry me back. To where my people are. That would have been the custom in that day. And yet Ruth abandons that custom. And says. Listen. Where you die. I die. And there shall I be buried. Don't pick me up and carry my bones. Back to that land of Moab. Uh, we might put it a different way. We might say, listen, I left hell and I have found peace, serenity in a new place. Don't take me back to the hell I already came from. But leave me where I am in peace and serenity. With the God that I'm going to come to know. Who is the creator and the sustainer of my life. And even in death. I want to be gathered with his people. And not the God from whence I have come. That's a bold. Bold. Statement. Now, you might be saying, well, did Naomi carry Elimelech and Mahan and 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 uh her other son back with her to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, back to Bethlehem? I don't know. I don't know. But it says here, archaeology here, meaning the, the cultural study Bible, archaeology has uncovered a number of cemeteries, many of which yield evidence that the deceased 
had passed away elsewhere, and their bones had been interred in the cemetery. Interred, I-N-T-E-R-R-E-D. In the cemetery, sometime after death and decomposition had occurred. Our text gives no indication that Naomi had brought her husband's and son's remains back to the family plot in Bethlehem. But if she did not, she likely was returning with them on this journey. A proper burial was a matter of great concern for people in the ancient world. Goals were to keep the deceased connected to the community of living relatives and descendants, as well as to help them transition into the community of the ancestors who had already died. The maintenance of the dead was a common practice as implied in the often elaborate tombs designed to accommodate the extended family. Continued care for the dead was a common practice in the ancient world and was believed to affect the afterlife of the deceased. What I want us to get out of today's lesson is basically, in terms of the cultural background that we're studying, look at Ruth. Look at Ruth. Ruth, become in this in this commentator's mind or surpasses Abraham the man of faith because Abraham had knew that God was before him and he was following what he believed in and what he knew was the, the true and living God. And he was called, led by that God. Ruth on the other hand, no such thing. But just like Abraham, she is walking by faith. Now, I may be mistaken, but I don't recall seeing Ruth in the Hall of Fame, the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. I, I may be mistaken about that, but I don't recall it at this moment. And yet, her faith in the unknown, unseen God is as great as or surpasses Abraham. How about that? And that prompts me to ask you today, where is your faith? What are you willing to follow sight unseen? And many of us have seen the works of God in our life. And how closely are we following him? I can testify that I know that God who created me sustains me. Because a couple of years ago, I was in a hospital and on my sick bed, on my deathbed even, and he raised me. I have faith in God because I know what God can do. I've seen what God can do. My mother was paralyzed from the, the waist down, and yet she learned to walk again and play basketball with my brother and I. I know God. Naomi knew God, but yet she was unwilling to point Ruth in the general direction of the God she knew. 
How often do we know God and yet fail to tell somebody, anybody, everybody about the God we serve and what he is capable of? We are willing to let them go back to the hell that we know that they were in rather than point them to the shalom that God offers. The peace that passes all understanding. Listen. I challenge you today. You may not know much about God. But that which you do know, tell somebody, anybody, that God is willing to save you. Not sometime in the future, but right now. It's important that Jude says we ought to be willing to snatch somebody from the fire. What we know is that God is a loving God, a compassionate God. What we know is he's a living God. What we know is that he, he does not require human sacrifice. What we know is the God that we serve is the God. And every other God is a God with a little G. Drugs ain't going to get it. Alcohol ain't going to get it. Anything else you want to try out there, it ain't going to get it. There's only one real God. The true and living God. And it is him to whom I give glory and honor and who I testify about. I'm not ashamed to tell you that I ain't been saved all my life. I'm not ashamed to tell you that I, I occasionally walked on the edge of the gutter and sometimes I fell in. But God. Picked me up from the miry clay, as they say, and placed my feet on solid ground. And what he has done for me, I guarantee you, he can do for you. Listen. I'm not, Naomi, I'm not going to point you back into the direction which you already know is not the place where you ought to be. I'm extending my hand to you right now and I'm going to say to you, come on. Let me lead you to God. Come just as you are. No, you don't have to get right. You don't have to uh, uh, wait until tomorrow. You can come now just as you are. And I guarantee you that God will not leave you as you are. He will pick you up. He will clean you up. He will turn you around. He will take you by the hand. He will walk with you. He will talk with you. He will pick you up and carry you if necessary. You are not alone. And whatever you have put before him, cars, houses, land, job, people, cigarettes, 
alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever you have put before him, is a little G God. Can't do nothing for you in the end. But this God, the God with the big G, I know that I know that I know that I know that he is able to carry you through. I know from personal experience. I know because he did it for me. And I know that if he did it for me, he can do it for you. Let us pray. Oh God, first and foremost, we want to thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in this study. We ask, Lord, that you allow us to apply it to our lives. That we might be a witness to somebody somewhere at some time that you are God and besides thee there is no other. And Father God, somebody out there today might have just happened upon this study. But they really want to know more about this God. Father God, we would ask that you would open a door that they might be able to see him for themselves. Give us, Father God, the heart's desire to want to go out and share with them who this God is. Introduce him to them that they may come to know him for themselves. God, we thank you and we praise you for all of those who are being snatched from the fire today and for the strength that you are giving to those who have heard your word and who desire to be more like you today than they were on yesterday. Until we meet again, Keep us, lead us, and direct us. Strengthen us and give us peace that passeth all understanding. In the name of Jesus the Christ we do pray. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of another study. And I will see you on next week. I do believe uh, if that's the weekend of September the 7th, then I will not be here. I have a previous engagement with our district planning meeting, and I won't be here. But if it is not the weekend of September 7th, then I'll see you next week. And until then, remember, God really does love you. And so do I. Thank you for joining us.